This is okay, Josh. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the INSHIP uh, lecture series. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Molly Waring and I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, our speaker for today. Uh, so Dr. Cassie Marshall is an assistant professor in the Maternal, Child and Adolescent Health Program at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Before joining the, the faculty at UC Berkeley, Dr. Marshall was a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research, um, where she received training in delivery science research. She also previously worked as a research fellow um, in the Division of Reproductive Health at the CDC. Uh, she has expertise in patient-centered contraceptive care and has conducted several research studies on women's contraceptive um, attribute, attribute, attribute preferences and method choices uh, and contraceptive decision support tools um, and uh, adherence to contraception. Um, so the goal of her re program of research is to promote reproductive and maternal health um, uh, uh, reproductive and maternal health equity by developing and implementing patient-centered interventions and delivery care models that meet the needs of and improve the health of particularly underserved women. Um, and our current research is focused on healthcare delivery strategies to improve contraceptive and preconception care, particularly with women of reproductive age who have diabetes or other chronic medical conditions. Um, so we are delighted to have her uh, with us today to talk about improving family planning care for patients with type 2 diabetes and hypertension. Um, so we're going to have her uh, present, uh, and then we'll have a period of question and answer. So it'd be great if you can either write down the questions you have or jot them in the chat. Um, and then um, during the Q&A, we will unmute everybody or give people the potential to unmute themselves if you want to either ask questions um, orally or uh, put the questions in the chat and we'll moderate. Um, so without further delay, uh, take it away, Dr. Marshall. Wonderful. Sorry, I don't mute myself. Thank you so much for that really nice introduction. Um, I'm very delighted to be here and really honored to have been asked. Uh, so just so I'll jump right in. So uh, briefly um, for an agenda, I'm uh, today I will give you some background on this topic. Um, so I'll talk about di excuse me diabetes and hypertension among patients of reproductive age, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about my path um, to thinking about improving family planning care for patients in this population. I'll talk about some of my previous work, and then I'll tell you about a current project that I am just embarking on. And then hopefully we have time for questions and you know some discussion. So okay, so about me. Um, you just heard an introduction, but I'll just briefly say my name is Cassie Marshall. As was mentioned, I work at UC Berkeley School of Public Health, where I am an assistant professor with our maternal child and adolescent health program. I'm a health services researcher, and my research interests include the intersection of family planning care and chronic disease management. So very relevant to what we're talking to about today, or what I'm talking about today, uh, person-centered contraceptive care and community-based models of doula care. And kind of cross-cutting through my research um, are mixed methods approaches, implementation science, and person-centeredness as a framework that really grounds my work. So a note about language. I wanted to put this out there from the beginning. Um, oh my goodness, sorry. Josh, you warned me about technical things. I think you all still see the right thing here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry, my computer was doing updates. A uh, note about language. So in this presentation, um, I will be talking, you'll see a lot of comments around women or women of reproductive age. And um, I wanted just to note that, you know, when we are thinking about delivery family planning care to patients um, who are in need of those services, that absolutely trans and gender non-conforming individuals need and should be concluded when we're thinking about how to deliver that care. Um, in this um, particular presentation, when I am referring to specific studies where the sample or population was women or presumed women, I try to be specific to that. Um, but I, in general, want us to think inclusively. And also, when I'm talking about my project at the end moving forward, you'll see I, I try to think um, and use language that kind of reflects this broader population in need of services. Okay, to jump in with some background. 
The population of reproductive age women with diabetes and hypertension is growing, and this has long-term and intergenerational effects. So a um, lot going on in this slide, but briefly, I'll just tell you that diabetes and hypertension, um, probably unsurprisingly to, to most people here, are two of the most common chronic uh, conditions in the United States among non-pregnant women um, the, between the ages of 20 and 44. So um, the most recent data, um, this is from a 2019 study showing that diabetes is about 5%, and hypertension is about 9% uh, prevalence in this population. And, and this is growing and this has been trending up um, over time. I actually just, I wasn't able to pull it for this talk because I just saw it like yesterday, but there was a study just published in JAMA this week looking at uh, cardiovascular disease risk factors, including these conditions here and other conditions in um, young adults. So really thinking about this like 20 to 44 age range um, has been increasing. Uh, diabetes and hypertension in particular disproportionately affect women of color. And so from the same study, we see that 8% of black and about 6% of Hispanic or Latino women of reproductive age have diabetes compared to 3% of non-Hispanic white women. And um, nearly 20% of black women of reproductive age have hypertension compared to eight, about 8% 8 of non-Hispanic white women. And these conditions have, um, long-term and intergenerational effects, as I mentioned. So, you know, bringing your attention to this figure on the right, it kind of demonstrates some of that or illustrates some of this. So you have these pre-existing chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes and hypertension. These, in terms of kind of reproductive health, can contribute to poor pregnancy outcomes. So um, in, the, in, in the baby, um, uh, particularly with diabetes, you see things like congenital defects, um, macrosomnia, preterm birth and stillbirth. And then in the birthing person, um, we see um, outcomes such as preeclampsia and placental abruption. So an increased risk for these uh, particular conditions. Um, and then in the long term, same thing, there, there are kind of long term sequelae for both. So in the birthing person, there is a higher risk of cardiovascular disease um, and overall just poor health and well-being. And in the uh, infant, in the, in the baby, there is an increased risk for these conditions in adulthood. So for diabetes, obesity, um, and ultimately cardiovascular disease as well. So when I'm thinking about these things, I, I often take the angle and say, okay, well, what is the implicate? What are the implications of this on reproductive health? And so I wanted to uh, briefly share some really striking literature about. Uh, chronic medical conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, and uh, family planning. So on the left here, you'll see um, some stats around un un unplanned pregnancy and chronic conditions. So uh, there is research showing that women with chronic conditions are more likely to report their pregnancies um, were unintended compared to those who, who don't have, uh, who don't report chronic conditions. Um, this is actually the second bullet is from an older, very old study, but it's, I think, the, the to my knowledge, the most recent one we have um, reports that actually in, in a particular sample, around two out of three of the pregnancies in women with diabetes were cited as, uh, reported as unplanned. And then with diabetes, again, this is really um, important because unintended pregnancies with poor glycemic control increases the chance of adverse pregnancy outcomes. So all the things that I was describing on the previous slide. And with respect to contraception, I bring this up here because it's very relevant. We know that contraception is a key way that people are able to manage their fertility and pre prevent um, unplanned pregnancies or rather allow people to uh, have pregnancies when they desire. Um, there's also a, a small but robust body of literature specifically focused on diabetes looking at this. And so what we learn here is that women with diabetes are less likely to receive contraceptive counseling or use contraception compared to women without diabetes. Women with diabetes um, more commonly use less effective methods. And so talking about methods in terms of efficacy in this particular, um, this particular work. And then finally, there's actually a recent study that was very interesting that looked at people and their contraceptive patterns before and after a diabetes diagnosis, right? To really see, you know, some of the hypothesis was, well, what's going on in these people before they had diabetes, right? And, and what this study showed is that women were actually less likely to use contraception after a diabetes diagnosis. So this all really points to potentially some unmet needs. It definitely points to, um, work to be done to think about the nature of 
uh, family planning in people with uh, among people who have chronic medical conditions and how that might influence reproductive health. So at this point, I kind of I want to introduce the concept of preconception care because it is trying to get at the gaps that I just described on the previous slide. Trying to, and I'll talk more about that. So what is preconception care? Essentially, you know, in the simple terms, it's preventative health care a patient receives before pregnancy to address pregnancy-related risk factors. So it's a set of interventions that aim to identify um, and modify biomedical, behavioral, and social risks to someone's health um, before pregnancy, so using prevention and management as a strategy. And it can include a lot of things. So um, here on the left, I have folic acid supplementation, diet and exercise counseling, optimization of ongoing medical conditions, the discontinuation of teratogenic treatments, um, screening for disease complications, and the provision of family planning services. And this is just some of it. So I wanted to point out a few things that are relevant for the conditions um, that I'm discussing today. So you can see under discontinuation of teratogenic treatment, I mentioned uh, dis the discontinuation of ACE inhibitors or ARBs. So these are um, hypertensive uh, hypertension medications and they have teratogenic profiles. So many of the guidelines suggest that if in a patient who um, is planning for pregnancy or may become pregnant, uh, recommendations include to move away from um, this these particular medications to a hypertensive medication that does not have that teratogenic profile. This is an example. Um, and then under provision of family planning services, I mentioned something very relevant for diabetes. So guidelines from the American Diabetes Association discusses uh, use of contraception until um, hemoglobin A1C is less than 6.5%. So until blood sugars are uh, tightly controlled um, is, is a recommendation. And again, that's to prevent some of the things we talked about on that first slide. So these congenital anomalies and other um, poor health outcomes in, in the baby, in the fetus, growing fetus. So that's what preconception care is. And there are strong guidance behind it from the CDC, from, uh, uh, like I said, the American Diabetes Association, the American College of Obst Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So here um, I have at the bottom there that, you know, the guidelines specifically say that chronic conditions, including diabetes and hypertension, should be optimally managed before pregnancy. Um, and there is some evidence to support this. The strongest evidence comes uh, from with, with respect to diabetes. So um, preconception care and the counseling associated with preconception care improves glycemic control, decreases the risk of congenital abnormalities, and improves pregnancy outcomes. That's a pretty strong body of literature. It's also cost effective. So there's been some work done to look at the cost effectiveness of providing this care in diabetes. And um, it's found that an estimated 5.5 billion would be saved um, in healthcare costs and uh, uh, low pr productivity due to preterm deliveries, birth defects, and perinatal mortality if preconception care were successfully delivered to every woman with diabetes. This was kind of a simulation. And then um, there's actually a recent paper that came out in 2022 that, that um, one of the results was specifically looking among women with chronic medical conditions, and it found that receiving contraceptive care or having a routine gynecological exam the year before conception lowered the odds of severe maternal morbidity. Um, and so, and this was true particularly, not in all women, but particularly in women with chronic medical conditions. And so, this is an observational study, but it is, you know, continuing to provide that rationale that having that preventative care before conception um, can potentially make a difference. And so the other point I want to make here is um, that this preconception care is also a strategy to reduce disparities in maternal morbidity and mortality. So in general, in the, in the United States, the studies have shown an increasing prevalence of pre-existing chronic conditions in the childbearing population, um, and that this is directly connected to the increases in maternal, um, the horrific, you know, increases in maternal morbidity and mortality that we're seeing. Um, but I'm sure, you know, many of you are aware of this, you know, really um, unacceptable data of the market and really striking racial disparities we see in maternal morbidity and mortality. So black women are three to four times 
more likely to die of pregnancy re uh, related causes. Um, indigenous populations also have a higher um, uh, risk for maternal morbidity and mortality. And when we look at the drivers of that, there are many, um, including variations in hospital quality, um, access to appropriate and high quality care, um, uh, implicit bias in the healthcare system, all of which structural racism underlines all of those things, right? Um, in addition, one of the drivers of these disparities we see are the kind of underlying chronic conditions and differences in the group who bear the burden of those underlying chronic conditions. And so racial and ethnic minoritized women are at a greater risk for conditions like pre-pregnancy diabetes and hypertension, which in turn then puts them at a higher risk for poor maternal health outcomes, so for poor pregnancy outcomes compared with white women. Um, even further, uh, some studies have shown that there are lower rates of this preconception counseling um, among racial and ethnic minoritized people, um, specifically when we look uh, at diabetes. So you can see greater burden, right, um, in this population that's already at a higher risk for maternal health um, complications, partially due to this, this chronic disease profile, and then also less likely to kind of receive this, this care in the preconception period. So really what I wanted to say here, and this re refers to the figure on the left, is just that when we think about this broader strategy and this broader conversation we're having right now um, in public health in the United States and policy to think about we how we address um, maternal health um, disparities and inequities um, and also overall think about improving maternal health. Preconception care is kind of one of that the key buckets we have to be thinking about, right? Like the, the, the conditions and the health care before pregnancy. So now that I've hopefully sold, not sold you, I don't, I'm not, I'm not here, I don't need to sell anyone, but I've kind of provided that rationale why it's important to think about um, this, you know, pre-pregnancy period and, and what's going on there and the conditions that are, um, uh, the health conditions that are, that are prevalent there, but also kind of um, this broader context in public health. I will now tell you there are many challenges to providing this sort of care to patients with chronic conditions, right? Even though the guidelines say, yes, this is really important and there's evidence supporting it, it's actually really difficult. And I put five of the reasons, five of the key reasons on this slide that I'll talk about briefly in turn. So unplanned pregnancy is one of them, um, which I, I talked about a little bit already. Unplanned pregnancy, I think a lot of the guidelines around preconception care and pre-pregnancy care kind of assume this notion of a planned pregnancy, that someone will, you know, know that they have this risk profile or they have these, you know, conditions, they can engage with their healthcare provider and they can think about the ways in which health can be improved um, before pregnancy. All the things I mentioned on the previous slide, the disease optimization, the, you know, moving away from ter 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 teratogenic profiles, the getting blood sugar under control, et cetera, et cetera, you know, improving kind of, um, blood pressure control it happens you know from this like point of view of like planning a pregnancy and as i also shared with you some stats that there's a higher rate of um unplanned pregnancy in this population and so that really makes it difficult um to provide this care in the way that it like often described in kind of the the, the ideal world of, of kind of clinical guidelines Second is care fragmentation. So in our current healthcare system, we often see reproductive health being and issues of family planning and sexual health being held in one place and with potentially one provider. And then chronic disease management of things like diabetes and hypertension happening in another place. Um, and because of this care fragmentation, these issues that might be very connected, right? Um, as I you know, hopefully convinced you they are, uh, can be dealt with and managed in different places, creating kind of um, uh, a fragmented sense of, of, of reproductive health and chronic disease management care. The next two are kind of related to each other, competing priorities. So um, some research has really shown that in a, let's say a single clinical encounter, if you have someone who is working on their blood sugar, who has, you know, a very high A1C or um, really, you know, out of control blood pressure, need to get that into um, control for their health issues such as contraception or talking about future plans in pregnancy, those might be deprioritized. 
um, and may not be deemed as pressing. Um, again, if you're looking at kind of the shorter term um, implications of having an out of control, you know, like I said, blood pressure, blood sugar, and that's due to this fourth thing I have on the slide, these, the pressures and the limited time in the clinical setting to address all of these issues. And then finally, there is some research showing lack of patient and provider knowledge. On the provider side, a lot of this has to do with um, uh, sometimes specialty care that may not be um, fully um, up to date on contraceptive methods that are or are not appropriate for various medical conditions. And certainly on the, um, as an example, and certainly on the patient side, knowledge of um, some research has shown there is kind of low uh, knowledge, variable. Actually, some have shown people are very aware of how their conditions might impact future pregnancies, but some have shown that there is low understanding of the connection of current conditions to future reproductive health. So that's a lot there, but just trust me that there are a lot of challenges to why we see this, these guide, you know, strong guidelines and emerging evidence, but still not really happening in practice. And I wanted to mention here, I think, really great conversations that are happening in our field about the concept of preconception health and preconception care. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't really acknowledge this. And here I just wanted to say that I think this is evolving, um, how we are thinking about things. And um, I just, I put a screenshot of this really great paper um, that came out in 2021. Um, titled Involving the Preconception Health Framework. And my goal here is just to acknowledge that things, um, we are kind of expanding our understanding, our conceptualization about how we definitely think of the important things I've talked about in the previous slide, but um, bring a new lens to it. And so I just pulled it, there's a few quotes from this paper that I think are especially powerful and what I mean by this. So you see in the first one, it says this new framework, this reproductive and sexual health equity framework is building on the strengths of preconception work and then the, you know, the influence it's had on public health over the past decades. But it's also reflecting an evolving understanding of its relationship to race and gender equity, structural and social influences on health and bodily autonomy. Um, this framework articulates a commitment to meeting people's reproductive and sexual health needs with explicit attention to structural influences in health and health care. Um, and then finally, I think this is like really gets at the key point here. This framework helps to conceptualize individuals and health needs as not constrained to only those with the potential to affect future reproductive outcomes, but are more broadly conceptualized. So again, this is you know, coming from the perspective, um, the important perspective that the preconception health, preconception care framework can sometimes narrow down important health issues and the optimization of health solely because it might affect a future, you know, pregnancy, right? It, it kind of views, it can view um, disease optimization and preventative health and all of these things through um, narrowly through the lens of um, just a few, uh, basically a future baby, essentially. And so I think this work is really calling us to think more broadly about structural factors, um, how people's choices may or, you know, may or may not be constrained. Um, many times there is this, like I said, this idea of like someone's going to walk in and talk about how they're planning their pregnancy and receive all the, the, the health care that they need to improve their health profile, et cetera, et cetera, to really for us to think more structurally about that and to think beyond just like, OK, how do we, you know, improve a future pregnancy? It, it's too narrow of a lens. And so, again, I just like whenever I have this this conversation, I like to put that out there and you'll see threads of this come up in some of the work I'm going to talk about in a moment. So, OK, I'm going to move. Ooh, I see. Um, oh, good. All right. Your Molly is just putting papers in the chat. Thank you. I saw the chat. I was like, oh, there might be a question. Um, so now hopefully that just provided some some good background and some food for thought and kind of set the stage for some of the things I'm going to discuss further. So now I'm going to tell you about some of my past work on this path, on this journey to thinking about improving care for this population. And so I'm going to talk to you about two studies uh, that I previous two of my previous studies and then we'll end on the gold box which is a project I'm embarking on um, right now so let's jump into it so this is um, a, a, one of my previous studies um, it was published in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine in 2021 um, and the objective of this was to look at the receipt of pre-pregnancy counseling among women with and without pre-pregnancy diabetes um, and or hypertension so 
uh, fits right into everything we've been talking about. And we hypothesize that people who have these conditions would be more likely to report receiving pre-pregnancy counseling than those without these conditions. And for this analysis, we use the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, or PRAMS. And this is a state-specific population-based surveillance system of women with a recent live birth, these are singleton births, um, conducted by the CDC in collaboration with state and local health departments. And in this, it's a survey, and women between two to eight months postpartum complete the survey about their attitudes, experiences, um, behaviors before, during, and shortly after their pregnancy. And for this analysis, we used um, 2016 to 2018 data. And you'll see in a moment, what we were trying to do is kind of look at multiple dimensions of pre-pregnancy counseling. I mentioned to you a moment ago, or pre I'm sorry, I should clarify, and for the purposes of this, I'm using pre-pregnancy and preconception interchangeably at this point, essentially. Um, but I mentioned to you before, there's a whole host of things that might happen under preconception care. And so what we were trying to do is look at some of those dimensions in this population. So briefly, um, this just shows you some of the overall of the, you know, the large PRAM sample that we were working with. Um, but I'll just say that we had about 3.5, 3.4, excuse me, women reported having pre-pregnancy diabetes and about 5% had hypertension. But when we kind of looked at the comorbidity, we saw this, and this is what's on the right, to about 2% reported having both diabetes and hypertension. Um, 1% had diabetes only, and about 3% had hypertension only. The vast majority, so you know, well over 90%, reported neither condition. Um, and the sample characteristics are on, on the left, but what I will say is that we did see, unsurprisingly, significant differences by a, several different sociodemographic characteristics. So, um, for example, age was one. Women with pre-pregnancy diabetes and hypertension were older in general with women without these conditions. Um, older in terms of the reproductive age years. And then we also saw other differences, um, uh, for example, with race ethnicity. So the majority of people who didn't have these conditions, there were more um, people who were not Hispanic white, whereas less than half of women with diabetes alone and hypertension alone were not Hispanic white. So we looked at a, um, a couple of different things. First, before we looked at these counseling outcomes, we looked at it in, uh, uh, an outcome of whether or not people had a, a pre-pregnancy healthcare visit. And this just refers to, did you have um, a healthcare visit in the year before you became pregnant? And what we saw here is that overall, 67% of women reported that they had a healthcare visit um, in the year before. Women who had both diabetes and hypertension, so this blue bar, this dark blue bar, um, had the highest prevalence, so that was around 73%, followed by women who had diabetes alone, um, then hypertension alone, and women with, um, without um, any either condition, there was about 67%, and this was statistically significant. And then when we looked at these specific counseling outcomes, there are a few things I want to point out here. So this is among the people who said, yeah, I had a healthcare visit. Uh, there are additional questions about the type of things they talked about with their healthcare providers. And so one thing I want to point out, I have that kind of bar at 50, that line at 50% that regardless of diabetes or hypertension status, less than half reported, um, uh, you know, having, having these different counseling um, outcomes. So um, overall, 44.8% reported receiving counseling about their desire to have or not have children. So this was a question really asking, did your provider talk to you about whether you wanted kids, you know, you know to have a, have a pregnancy in the future or not? Um, and um, about 29, so 30% reported receiving counseling on how they could improve their health before a future pregnancy. Um, there's one I don't have shown here, um, but there's one about uh, using birth control to prevent pregnancy, and 42% said that. And so you can see there, like I said, below 50% for everybody, but there are some uh, differences. So. Um, uh, you, you know, there were more than 40% of women with diabetes alone and those with hypertension alone reporting receiving how to improve their health before pregnancy. And those two are the higher bars, the kind of gold and brownish bar on the right. 
So of course we looked at this using multivariable models um, to, to really test this hypothesis. And the, the, these are the results here. So in the second column is that outcome around whether or not your provider discussed um, a desire to have or, or not have kids. So again, this is like before, you know, in the year before your pregnancy, before you became pregnant, did you have a discussion with your healthcare provider about this? And we saw that women with hypertension alone were significantly more likely to report receiving counseling about their desire to have or not have children. So that's bolded there. Um, but we didn't see any differences um, with women who report, you know, had diabetes only or women who had both conditions um, compared to women who, who had neither conditions. Um, they were not more likely to report this. And the second column uh, is this issue of whether or not your provider discussed with you how you could improve your health before pregnancy. And uh, what we saw is that uh, in the adjusted models, women with diabetes alone, uh, you know, had a, uh, uh, increased risk. So the, the prevalence ratio was 1.4. And women with hypertension alone, um, had a prevalence ratio of 1.3, they were both more likely to report they received counseling about how they could improve their health. So that was consistent with our hypothesis. But we didn't find an association for women who had both reported both conditions compared to those who had no conditions, which was very interesting. And then in the third um, outcome, the one uh, that I mentioned is whether or not you're, the provider discussed using birth control to prevent pregnancy. And again, I think this is an important outcome. Um, in the, one of the first intro slides, I had shared a, a study that had shown if you had a contraceptive visit, I mean, the year before pregnancy, that was associated with the reduction in maternal morbidity. So we looked at this, and um, in this one, uh, people who had hypertension alone were significantly more likely to report receiving counseling on using birth control than women without either condition. But again, we saw no differences with those who reported, who, or excuse me, those who had both conditions or those who reported that they had um, just diabetes. They were no more likely than those without conditions to report that their provider discussed birth control with them. So again, some of that is somewhat consistent with some of the previous research I showed you about diabetes and contraception. So in this study, we uh, conclude, you know, to summarize, we saw that nearly 30% of women with a recent live birth who had pre-pregnancy diabetes and or hypertension were reported that there was no healthcare visit in the year before pregnancy. So that's certainly concerning. And then even amongst those who did report having some, you know, access and touch points with the healthcare system and with a provider before their pregnancy, less than half <clears throat> reported having pre-pregnancy counseling and that having these conditions did not kind of consistently increase the likelihood of receiving counseling. So depending on the outcome we were looking at, we also looked at folic acid, which I didn't show here, you know, for time, but it, it, it really differed across the board. We didn't see having these conditions kind of prompted additional counseling or more counseling. And so we concluded from this that, sure, you're not shocked, there are missed opportunities for this sort of counseling in women with diabetes and hypertension. So I'll briefly talk about another one of our studies, and this is um, uh, work that's currently in press right now. Um, and this is uh, looking specifically at diabetes. This was um, a small qualitative study where we recruited pregnant women who um, ages 18 to 50 who had pre-existing diabetes and were receiving care at a specialty diabetes clinic um, in uh, Northern California. And this reflects, this what's being shown here reflects uh, data from 22 interviews that were conducted in 2020 and 2021. And the interviews explored, uh, you know, participants' experience of becoming pregnant, their attitudes and beliefs around pregnancy planning, their attitudes and beliefs around how diabetes had affected their experience of becoming pregnant, and finally, their healthcare experiences prior to pregnancy. And the analysis here really focuses on that piece, this kind of before you were pregnant, your interactions with your healthcare providers. So we uh, used a qualitative content analysis to analyze all of this interview data, um, and it was kind of both an, you know, deductive and inductive approach. So briefly, just to tell you I mean, about our participants in this study, um, over a third identified as white. We had uh, nearly 30% who reported more than one racial and ethnic identity. This sample was a bit of a higher socioeconomic status. More than 70% reported private or employer-based insurance, health insurance, and about two-thirds did report a bachelor's degree. 
Um, you'll see on the right in that table is about 50-50 split amongst type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And um, people were between 21 and 40 years of age and were kind of at various stages in their pregnancy at the time of the interview. And um, the majority reported that they did receive some sort of counseling with respect to their diabetes before they became pregnant. But there were over a quarter who reported they had no, you know, in their, in their experience, they did not discuss pregnancy at all um, with the healthcare provider before they became pregnant. And so we analyzed this data um, to kind of identify salient themes about experiences. And so there are five here, and I'll talk about these in turn. The first one is that there was no standard version of counseling. Second theme is that the information provided during counseling typically focused on the risk of diabetes in pregnancy. Theme three were that patients generally felt, um, patients seeking counseling generally felt that their providers were supportive of their desire for pregnancy. Theme four is something we're calling insider knowledge, which I'll elaborate on in a moment. And then theme five was around a different, a desire for a different approach. So in theme one, we observed that there are no standard version uh, of preconception counseling in this population. So, and by that, I mean, when it occurred, who, per, you know, which provider offered it or that they, you know, which provider discussed these issues with them, the type of clinical visit, and who initiated the conversation. So only a few participants had a formal, like, preconception care visit, like, which can be scheduled, right, to plan for pregnancy with a healthcare provider. Um, that was not common in our sample. It was mostly, if it did happen, it was happening in kind of other types of healthcare visits. The people who did have these very formal preconception care visits, nearly all of them uh, had type 1 diabetes. Counseling was often provided when requested by participants. So in, in, in the vast majority of cases, people who received this went to their providers and said, hey, I'm thinking about pregnancy. Can we talk about how my diabetes might impact that? And there was a vast, we heard various things about who offered this, who had these conversations and was counseling with them. So the three common ones are endocrinologists, obstetrician, gynecologists, and their primary care providers. So this is a quote uh, um, from one of the participants who said, I'm very glad we had that opportunity, but I definitely had to seek it out. That counseling wasn't necessarily going to be offered to me. And um, so this, you know, this is also making the point that of the participants who received counseling, many, like I said, many sought it out. And in this way, preconception counseling was connected to how planned a pregnancy was. So back to what I said in the beginning about some of the barriers, which is with when there's an unplanned pregnancy. With a planned pregnancy, our data kind of showed this out. You know, people who were planning went and they requested it and they were, you know, provided it. Theme two was that the information during counseling typically focused on the risk of diabetes in pregnancy. And um, so this is for the people who did report some counseling. They described that they, um, yeah, heard mostly about the risk. And by risk here, I'm talking about medical complications that could arise during pregnancy due to poorly controlled diabetes, such as birth defects and miscarriage. Um, and that this was particularly true for those who reported having that formal visit. So if you did have that formal vi preconception visit where the whole focus of the appointment was to talk about kind of planning for pregnancy given the condition, it was very kind of risk focused. The medical complications were front and center. And so unsurprisingly, participants expressed kind of the emotional impact of this risk-based counseling. Um, the words that we heard were, you know, causing worry, hopelessness, and even devastation. And that is the, the quote here. This person says, they tell you, oh, you have high risk of literally everything. This is just a high risk type of situation. So naturally, this is the participant reflecting back, I was devastated because you never think about these things. The third thing we identified is that patients seeking that counseling, um, and a pot, you know, I think this was encouraging, generally felt their providers were supportive. Um, they, des they described that their providers offered them resources to help them achieve a healthy pregnancy, that they had positive yet realistic attitudes about patients' pregnancy goals, um, and that they clearly explained like how to manage blood sugar and how to think about blood sugar as uh, when planning a pregnancy. Um, so this person says, um, you know, the, the quote on the right says, they all did a really good job of just explaining what it all meant. And um, she was saying it, referring to the doctor, in my experience, you're not going to have perfect blood sugars, and that's okay. 
That being said, there was a minority of cases. In this case, it was three participants, and they were all participants who had type 2 diabetes, um, described that they felt unsupported when they did approach their provider um, about their desire for pregnancy. And in one case, a participant described feeling what she called pushback from her provider um, about their desire to become pregnant. Um, and in another case, this is a person who had type 1 diabetes. And in this current pregnancy, felt supported. But in the past, she had she was shared that she had heard she felt dissuaded from getting pregnant. So I mentioned this, even though it was kind of a minority of cases in our sample, because it, you know, it's, you know, potentially has um, implications for reproductive autonomy, um, provider bias, all sorts of things, which I'm going to circle back to in a moment. And theme four was around something we called insider knowledge. So it just so happened in this sample, we ended up having some people who had, a, you know, some very, some connection to clinical care, whether they were like a medical assistant or um, in this case, this person was a nurse or they had been like a health educator. They had some kind of connection. And so we observed in all of these people that they expressed some sentiment related to them knowing to request counseling or ask information about diabetes and pregnancy based on their professional role or their insider role, but not due to the care that they had received, right? So they applied their like clinical or whatever knowledge to their personal lives. Um, and as such, they expressed that kind of concern that patients who didn't have this professional role or a clinical background wouldn't even know enough to know what to ask. So this person on the right says, I wonder if I wasn't a nurse, would I have known to bring it up, pregnancy, up that far in advance? I don't know. So she's really saying like, I knew this was an issue because of my job, but no one had really expressed to me the importance of thinking about my blood sugar and diabetes um, early on in the planning phase. And then finally, we did observe a desire for a different approach to counseling. Participants shared uh, their thoughts on how they believed counseling should occur, right? So this was interesting. Um, some people felt that there should be information about pregnancy and diabetes offered as part of their routine diabetes care. Just, you know, I, you know, I check in with, you know, for my medication, I check in around my blood sugar. Like this should kind of be ongoing conversations where people just check in with me, meaning my providers check in with me. Now, other, there's a range of opinions. Others felt that this counseling wouldn't be particularly welcome if that didn't match their current life stage. So if you're not trying to conceive, why is my provider talking to me about contraception or, you know, or like planning for a pregnancy, right? So there was a range. So, and then there was like even some contradiction within that. I really like this quote at the top. Um, this person says, I think looking back, I would have liked someone to say something. She's referring to, uh, you know, about how diabetes and pregnancy are, you know, can, how diabetes can impact pregnancy, but then says, but I also don't think that I would have been receptive to it. So, you know, there, there, there's, there, it's, it's not super clear cut. And then, um, other preferences we heard were around kind of the nature and the tone of the information provided. And so this person on the bottom right talked explicitly about like bias and said that I think that requires uh, taking a moment. This is she's talking. This person is talking about their what a provider should do. It requires taking a moment and putting aside whatever preconceived notions you might have about a patient based on age, race, what assumptions you might have with this person's socioeconomic background. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to this idea of reproductive autonomy, bias, how those things intersect in these type of counseling conversations. So, you know, in terms of our conclusions from this study is that, you know, we did not observe any standard experience of preconception counseling. This wasn't a shock to us because there actually isn't a recommended model um, although there's recommendations for, you know, preconception care and counseling, there isn't a recommended model for delivering this to adult patients with diabetes. There actually has been some wonderful um, work focused on adolescent people, adolescent um, girls, in this case, um, that's how it was described, uh, with diabetes about kind of reproductive health and sexual health counseling. Um, but there isn't a model for adult patients. Um, and so I, you know, for me, it was like, I'm not surprised that it happened in different places and with different providers and in different ways and often was initiated by patients because of, because of that. Secondly, that we might need to consider diabetes type 
more um, when we think about these interventions to improve the delivery of counseling to this pa uh, patient population. And our study, again, it was a small exploratory study. We, we did do analysis separately of di diabetes type, but it wasn't designed to make kind of comparative, it wasn't designed for comparison. And our findings did suggest there, you know, we need to a study this further, but also might in our interventions think about the differences between type one and type two diabetes, which also makes sense because they have different etiologies, epidemiologies, and they're managed differently clinically in our healthcare system. And then finally, our findings suggest that there's a need for a model of counseling counseling that is proactive and balances information on the risk of diabetes and pregnancy with opportunity to um, optimize outcomes. Right. So, yes, it's important to focus on those risks, but patients or participants desired something that is like, OK, well, what can I do? Right. Um, and then finally, that uh, an intervention that allows patients to tailor information and counseling based on their reproductive life stage and goals. So. Hopefully that gave you a flavor of some of my past work and how I ended up where I am, which is to talk to you um, and I am wrapping up, I promise uh, to talk to you about um, this uh, project I'm working on now, which is around adapting a patient facing decision support for black and Latina patients of reproductive age with type 2 diabetes or hypertension. This is um, my, uh, I have an NIH career development award to do this work from the National Institutes on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And we are thinking really here of patients with the capacity for pregnancy. So just briefly, I'll say this project aims to adapt an existing patient decision support tool in the primary care setting to improve reproductive health outcomes in this population. So type 2 diabetes and hypertension. And this is just a screenshot from the tool that I'm adapting, which is called MyPath. So this was developed by Dr. Lisa Caligari. Um, and this is a my path is a novel patient facing web based and mobile optimized decision support tool for reproductive decisions. And the, the objectives of the tool, this was designed for veterans, reproductive age veterans um, in the and to be used in the VA in the primary care system to help uh, people consider their reproductive health goals. Um, in their health and psychosocial context to augment knowledge about fertility. Um, contraception, preconception health, to align their timing of pregnancy and contraceptive decisions with their goals, and to communicate effectively with primary care providers about all of these things. And so there is research behind this. When this tool has been used prior to uh, primary care visits within veterans um, who weren't seeking pregnancy, it includes, it, excuse me, increase uh, patient-centered reproductive counseling discussions um, it, without increasing providers' work, perceived workload. Um, the people, patients who used it had gains in self-efficacy around communication, contraceptive decision quality, and even use of effective contraceptive methods. So th this is, I think, a very promising approach. Now, it was, like I said, developed in the VA and within the VA system, and it wasn't designed for any particular racial ethnic background or any specific medical condition. So I propose to adapt this for type 2 diabetes and hypertension, specifically focused on Black and Latina um, patients. So just briefly, why, why did I think this is a good idea? So I'll talk about kind of why a patient decision support tool and why primary care. So a decision support tool is easy to provide. It allows you to provide tailored in education about diabetes, hypertension, and pregnancy. It can contribute to increased agency. It helps patients assess their reproductive goals. It helps patients consider their contraceptive options, which is a very preference sensitive decision. They can be culturally adapted to be relevant and then can be shared with the provider, the kind of results of using this so that the provider can be more aware of a, a person's goals um, and their values and their preferences around fertility and pregnancy. And that can ultimately help facilitate a high quality interaction. The primary care setting is, I think, really perfect for this because type 2 diabetes and hypertension are mostly managed in this setting. Um, we can integrate reproductive goals with diabetes, and that can provide a braided rather than a fragmented care experience for people um, who are in need of these services. It can be time efficient, allowing the per primary care provider to address reproductive care needs in the context of ongoing chronic disease management. So I'm going to leave some time for, uh, I'm not going to go through these in turn. Basic, oh, I'll go quickly. So basically, I have three aims of this project. The first one is really formative work to understand 
reproductive decision-making processes and care preferences in the population of Black and Latina people um, of reproductive age who have type 2 diabetes and hypertension. This is also going to bring in, this qualitative work is going to bring in person-centeredness and structural competency as a framework, really to think about the way in which structural factors influence health and also also how healthcare providers wrestle with these structural factors. The hope is that we, in this qualitative work, we can then adapt the decision support tool and um, actually you know, do user testing, cognitive interviews to make sure that it really meets the needs of patients. And then in AIM-3, hopefully the intervention will be adapted, the patient decision support tool will be adapted, and we are going to focus more on implementation. So we'll be assessing the acceptability and feasibility of this intervention um, and evaluate the implementation context. Briefly, I'll just say, I think this is so important because notoriously patient decision support tools are really hard to integrate in practice. They've been developed, they've been, they've shown that they can be useful in all of these outcomes, knowledge and behavior, but they're actually hard to use in clinical practice. And so I'll be doing that, particularly in a community health setting. Briefly, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't think I need to convince everyone, but just to talk about why I think this approach will help to address outcomes. It focuses on um, racial and ethnic minoritized people who have chronic conditions. This is important because most of the research, particularly with diabetes, on preconception health and diabetes has focused on type 1 diabetes and non-Hispanic white populations. Um, like I said, we're specifically using these implementation science methods that I think are important because it addresses, helps to address this issue of integration into clinical care, which has been really difficult for patient decision support tools. We are going to bring in that structural and person-centered lens to help think about autonomy and also the legacy of structural bias when it comes to reproductive health in this country. And then finally, I'm trying to do this work in a community health center, so meaning a federally qualified health center environment. Um, which is an important part of our primary care safety net. It does have, uh, in, you know, a large, a high prevalence of these conditions that I'm focused on, but often have been excluded from research. Um, and so I'm wrestling with this all right now. Um, I've gone over time and I want to make sure we leave some time open for questions. So sorry I had to rush this piece a bit, but I will just, you know, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thank you for your time. Hopefully there's something here that was in, um, interesting and um, thought provoking and I'm happy to take some questions. Fantastic. I really enjoyed uh, hearing about your work. Um, and I know I have questions but before I dive in with my questions. Um, you know, I want to open it up to, to folks on the call. Um, does anyone uh, have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or uh, put your questions in the chat and I'm happy to read them aloud. Hi, I'm a student here um, at UConn and I definitely have a passion for public health, especially uh, maternal, black maternal health. And um, go, I want to be an OBGYN actually and like, help from an administrative role in public health. And I just wanted to know uh, what your opinion is on like implementing these uh, interventions in terms of like birthing centers versus hospitals and what you think like at this point in time would be like more feasible and more helpful to uh, women who wanna get pregnant or are pregnant. Well, thank you, A, thank you for being here and thank you for your um, really important question. I mean, I think there's two aspects of that. Like when we're thinking of pregnant people and people and kind of meeting their needs and getting tailored care around pregnancy and certainly around like pre-existing conditions, the, the options are very limited, right? Like um, I had a student who actually worked on a, the, an analysis looking at this last year about people's like where they want to give birth. And, and, and there's actually um, not enough birth centers or kind of non kind of hospital options in many places for that. And so there is a lot of work to be done to think about the places that people can receive pregnancy related care, can deliver um, their babies, um, that sort of thing. Um, I, I do absolutely, and, and, and the care can be very different, right? Um, in a hospital versus other settings. Also care can be very different from like, you know, thinking of the whole perinatal experience, prenatal and postpartum, whether you're using a midwife model of care or kind of an OB care. So, I mean, there's so much there. If that's what you're interested in, you have like a whole career <laughs> working and untangling that because there, there is a lot there. And, and the patient kind of the angle that I would take on it is thinking about the preference, like where, what do people want to do? And, and is that accessible? Um, from you know some of the work that I'm talking about, which is a little bit outside of pregnancy, 
I do think we need to think about where this care happens. I'm, you know, mostly focused on the primary care setting, which absolutely OB-GYNs work in and family planning is happening and reproductive health and prenatal care and the community clinics that I'm trying to work with, all of those things are happening, but they often aren't like designated places that only do kind of, you know, reproductive health or, you know, sexual health work. They're also doing primary care work. And so I do think that's part of what I'm trying to do in my AIM-1, the formative work, like where do people want to have these conversations? Which providers do you want to talk to? Do you want to talk to the person that manages your hypertension about your pregnancy goals? Is that someone else, right? So I do, I think there's a lot to unpack there. Does that answer some of your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and that actually uh, dovetails nicely with one of the questions I had. I thought your finding in the focus group um, where it was uh, more likely that women with type 1 diabetes who had had those, um, you know, preconception visits and, and conversations versus the woman with type 2 diabetes, it made me wonder sort of which providers had those conversations and whether it's women with type 1 diabetes, um, you know, maybe it's their endocrinologist or it's sort of more of a... Um, the conversation about reproductive choices and reproduction is more of a conversation in their whole disease management than maybe with type two. Um, and so I thought that that was sort of, you know, really interesting in terms of thinking about, you know, where do we intersect with women to get them to be having these preconception conversations and then, and then with whom, um, you know, I think, it, you know, as you were saying, it's a real challenge when there are so many unplanned pregnancies of how do you stick in a visit before an event that, that may not be, um, may not be as planned. Um, you know, would you say, you know, am I guessing right that, that many of the women with type 1 diabetes, you know, had a conversation with an endocrinologist versus with, with primary care? We, yes. Yeah, so you're, I agree with all of your observations. But again, this is kind of a small, very exploratory study. So I do think there needs to be more work to kind of like really see like, are these, you know, true differences? But in our sample, the patients with type 1 diabetes, many of them had like very tight relationships with their endocrinologists. And they talked about all sorts of things, it seems like, you know, be not just focused on diabetes or um, blood sugar, but um, many of them were receiving that, you know, thinking about reproductive health, thinking about future pregnancy with their endocrinologists. Um, it wasn't exclusive that way, but yes, that it seemed like that was mostly with type 1 diabetes. Um, sometimes it was also the obstetrician gynecologist. By and large, the type 2 diabetes people who did report they had some conversations, it was happening with their primary care providers. Um, fascinating. Uh, before I move into the other questions, anyone else, uh, you know, anyone else have a question? All right, well, I have another question. I, you know, I was, um, I enjoyed hearing about the, the PRAMS data. Um, you know, PRAMS is a, a wonderful resource for, you know, for population-based research uh, in this area. I was also wondering if you'd ever use National Survey of Family Growth, because that's another one of these national surveys with a real focus on um, family formation. And one thing I found about that is interesting is there's a lot of attitudes about um, desire for additional pregnancies or desire for children and things like that. So I was just wondering if you'd used any of uh, those data in any of your work. No, but I should. No, I ha and I remember at some point a couple of years I was looking into it because they do actually ask. They don't have a, a lot of different medical conditions, but I, they definitely do have information on diabetes. Um, it's they don't. I don't think it's stratified by like type of diabetes, which is limitation. But absolutely for what you're saying around, I think thoughts around like yeah, family formation and desires um, is something that I need to revisit. If you're interested, maybe we should talk about it. <laughs> maybe I know for me, National Survey of Family Growth, it's on it's one of those data sets that's on my like to-do list to, to get, you exactly. know, exactly absence of a you know of a specific project. I haven't I haven't gotten around to it uh yet. Um but no, absolutely. I that's I do think that would be um certainly a good place for future work. Uh, yeah, no, so I was really loving our um thought and, you know, thinking about as you're de developing this uh, patient decision support tool, thinking about implementation and how you're really taking the implementation lens um, to this work. Um, I know you're just starting your, your K01 work um, or, you know, in the, in the beginning processes, um, you know, as you've been talking to um, providers, particularly at community health centers, you know, what are your sort of, uh, you know, sort of senses so far about what they think the implementation challenges are um, to, you know, once you develop this to integrating it into their uh, clinical flow? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's already things that are coming up. I mean, just the and you you would think I. I mean, I in some ways I think I was aware aware of some of the challenges and um, I don't say roadblock, but just the real integration issues that might be there. I 
did a whole postdoc in delivery science, thinking about kind of how the, you know, delivery of care, although in a very different setting. Um, but just in the meeting the other day, we were, they, we were just talking about like, no, like very low use of kind of uh, the health, you know, like the patient engagement, the patient portal um, electronically, right? Um, so getting at, you know, you know, in my health system, I'm able to go online and get into the health, you know, the patient portal and see my result, test results and message with my doctor and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things we were thinking about is the possibility of, you know, is there even a possibility of leveraging that for some of this in, in, in terms of appointment scheduling um, of, you know, getting the patient decision support tool, being able to send information to your provider. Writer. And so I think increasingly I'm realizing in certain situations that's that's just not going to be an option, like at all. Yeah. And is that um, you know, is that because patients don't know that the that those electronic resources are available? It's it, is it that they don't find them helpful? Is that the system is not usable? Is it that like they don't have the digital health literacy to you? You know, I wonder what the challenges are there and whether understanding challenges could you know give you insights on uh, and whether or not that would be a, an open approach for patients yeah like longer term that is, you're 100 percent right and that is uh, there are a lot of people who that's like they're, they study this and i need to find them and like yeah better understand like what are some of that some of the issues there i just know kind of from my initial conversations with providers it's been like uh yeah no like that that's not going to happen has been like the initial additional reaction so i do want to do some deeper digging there yeah, and I wonder, you know, if talking to patients in your, um, you know, in your target population, they might yeah. be able to, oh, well, the reason I don't use this is because I tried once and my doctor never got back to me or like the system is terrible or whatever it is, you know. Um, so no, in fact, we do ask about, I mean, in our, the qualitative interviews, we're asking about preferences, but I actually think I should add, you know, be a little bit more specific about like the system in that, you know, the specific system with their clinic, because I do think it would reveal important insights like, like that you're mentioning. Yeah. Um, this is fascinating. I know we're we're creeping right up, but we hit one thirty one thirty five. Uh, does anyone else have any any last questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for a really wonderful and interesting talk. Um, I will um, also encourage people to watch the recording later for those who, uh, who couldn't attend today. Um, but you know, thank you very much for joining us here at InShip and uh, and sharing your very exciting research. I look forward to uh, to hearing the results of your study as you move forward with your K. Thank you so much, and yeah, thanks everyone for the the warm welcome. And yeah, thank you.